Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode here of the Echelon Cycling Podcast, where we, of course, discuss what's happened in the week and look towards the next week as well. And as always, I'm joined by Patrick, the owner of Audu Cycling, and of course, also the Cycling Danes, Mr. Crowder himself, Ewan Wilson. And I mean, guys, the, the thing we first have to say is our absolute deepest condolences. I know it doesn't bring him back or anything to Gino Merda's family and friends. That was absolutely horrible. And uh, such an incredible rider. And yeah, guys. It's uh, a great shame. We shouldn't be here having this sort of, this opening to the podcast. We shouldn't have professional riders go out there for our entertainment, for their own entertainment, for our sort of interest and have them lose their life at such a young age. This just shouldn't be how it is. Gino was a special talent on and off the bike. We saw his capabilities on the bike. He was a Giro d'Italia stage winner. He was in the white jersey of the Vuelta a España in 2021. And off the bike, he was a real character who wanted to change things. He wanted to use his notoriety in cycling to good use. He wanted to make the world a better place. And you can see that in sort of his interviews with certain people with uh with his, his initiative at the Balta Espana in 2021, where he wanted to, to plant more trees and so forth. He was really sort of, he had a formative time writing for the Quebec uh, team back in the day and seeing the, the good work that they were doing. He himself wasn't sure if he even wanted to stick in cycling as well, but he wanted to carry on doing it to use his platform for good use. And I think that's what we should really sort of remember about Gino Omeda is that he was a mind so powerful within our professional peloton. And it's such a shame that we have to have this conversation right now because we shouldn't be. Evidently, all of our three thoughts, all of our thoughts, I can't even put a quantity to it, you know, are with Gina Meda, his mother, his family, everyone who knew him from friends to journalists to colleagues to everyone within our sport. I feel like it's been a lot of mind power and a lot of grieving that we've all been through together and it's definitely put this week in a very different light but yeah i mean um that sad news or sad yeah sad news aside uh we have got a quite a big program here uh in terms of the races of course there was still racing going on the tour de swiss the tour of slovenia the giro d'italia under 23 the route de Occiten race and of course the belgian tour and other races as well but uh, that's all we've kind of really put in time but we might as well start with the tour de swiss because uh, there were stages that happened before the incident as well and i mean um yeah what did you think of well we can start with one of the positives binyam gamai winning a stage coming back after his unlucky crash in the tour of flanders were on his birthday and uh yeah, do you think potentially he could be on for a stage win here as well? Yeah, there were certainly some good performances through the week, despite the tragic news that came out of the Tour de Suisse. You know, it's there were still things which went on, and Binny's thing, like you say, such a good thing that he came back from his setbacks. Do I think that he could win a stage of a tour? Yeah, I do think he he could. He showed of a Tour de Suisse, everybody a, a very clean set of heels. It was a pretty fair and square victory. It wasn't lucky or it was definitely won by merit you know he beat Wout Van Aert who he did launch early like he was a bit out of position but you know that's just the way it is in cycling sometimes I do think maybe the first two stages might be a little bit too hard especially when you consider like Van der Poel who of course we'll get on to later who's been at the Barwell's Belgium tour just shredding it maybe stage one might be a little bit too far but I certainly think there's stages which will suit Binny we've talked a lot about Cav and stage 19 but I do think that looks like a stage which Binny could win I think it depends it's going to be those sort of what have been touted as kind of Michael Matthews or Peter Sagan stages from uh, years gone by any ones of those stages I do think that Binny could win and I think that Intermarche should be very rallied around him as probably their main man as to realistically win a stage because uh, no offence to the rest of the Intermarche team, I just think that Binny is their most likely candidate. So I do think that he could win a stage, absolutely. Thinking about Binny Grimai, that really was a standout performance uh, over the first couple of, of stages because 
over the maybe the past couple of weeks we're missing that Brussels Cycling Classic missing the mark as well as sort of some of these early season races as well there are a couple stages of the Tour de France that you could definitely flag up that that, that could suit BM Grimai I think the opening stage might be a bit tough but I'm really liking the look of the finish to Limoges in the opening week of racing uh there's a bit of a sort of a false flat kicker towards the end that's where Marcel Kittel actually took a stage win back in 2016 Dean, it was uh, in a photo finish with Brian Cocar. I think with that like uphill finale, he could have an edge over Jasper Philipsen or maybe Fabio Jakobsen in, in that final dash to the line. So I think it could definitely be within his realm to win a stage. And I believe Antomarche should go all hands on deck for him. They've got a really solid team. We saw that Mike Turnison, for instance, took a stage win the other week. We've also, I mean, we've got Taco van der Horn and so forth. A lot of these engines coming to in, in support of Binium Grimai. It could be quite a fruitful Tour de France. I think a green jersey might be a bridge too far, but winning a stage is his goal. He's actually been saying it in sort of interviews and uh, press releases as well. He wants to win that stage. And I think Binim Grimai is really believing in that. I mean, we might as well hear what the man himself thought when I asked him the question. What do you think of the Tour de France route in 2023? Oh, it was quite interesting. I mean, uh, there is five, six stages they really suit me. And then also the, the flat sprint was... Uh, uh, something special to uh, to see in, in tour, you know. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. I think this year to to pass by tour. If he does win, okay. There's two things. Louis Menkes is always also coming top ten last year at the Tour de France. Arguably the best uh, GC rider from Africa right now. But yeah, we've also got. Well, you were saying that. Fabio Jacobs and all of these are the ones you get had needs to get rid of if it's a flat finish. So it probably is going to be more of an uphill. If he does win, I don't know if you saw the Tour de Suisse the, when he won. They went crazy. And I think the Tour de Suisse uh, officials weren't quite ready for the Bini Mania. And they jumped the barrier. No one, the, yeah, the poor press uh, officer of uh, Intermarché Circus, Sarah, she's very nice. Uh, she had to try and fend off some very big uh, train men uh, away from Binny. So um, imagine if he wins at the Tour. It's going to go crazy. Louis Mekis, uh, is that going to be a problem, you think? Or is he kind of self-sufficient? And the Tour de Suisse lead out, he kind of got lost from his lead out men. But I mean, it's better to make that mistake. We've been talking a lot about that. They didn't need to really forge this bond. Potentially, it will be fine. I think it will be. Um, like you're saying, Bianquez is relatively self-sufficient. We saw that with Palp Duez last year. I feel like that's more his kind of thing, is going to be mountain breakaways and very Guillaume Martin in that sort of vein, is that you kind of drop out of GC and the... I feel like that's his kind of thing, um, more than likely. I do see that Bianquez will be relatively self-sufficient in that, but, you know, there's also Zimmerman here, who, of course, won a stage for Dauphiné, but they also have... Uh, Rui Costa, Lydian Kalmajan, Koba Kosens, people like that who could very well support Mienkes and his mountain stuff, but they're crucially there to also make the hills hard for Binny so that they can get rid of the sprinters because you need the climbers there who can set that pace to drop a Jakobsen or a Philipson and stuff like that because I do think that Binny is probably a better climber than Philipson. I don't think, for example, stage one of the Giro last year I don't think Philipson would have competed in that, whereas Binny was up there. So that's kind of a comparison that I'm drawing. But I do think that, going back to what I was saying about Michael Matthews-esque stages, there aren't too many of them this year. It's worth noting there's not too many of those intermediate puncher finishes. They all come relatively, kind of, basically the ones which are there, it's going to be like, well, Vanderpol, well, Alaphilippe, well, Pidcock, well, Wout Van Aert. And it's, so, it's going to be very difficult for Binny to win I think, but that's not saying that he's out of the question. I think that he is very good and he can certainly be the best on his day. You know, we've seen that time and time again, and I don't see why the Tour de France would be a hurdle too far. Yeah, I mean, last year at the GDAR, 
he was right up there with Mathieu van der Poel. He's looking excellent at the moment. You would assume maybe he could uh, he could be doing the same thing here at the Tour de France on some of these like punchy finishes. That I would, I always say Mathieu van der Poel maybe has an edge in those kind of finishes over the likes of Wout van Aert and so forth. I think he's the more reliable at, at these punchy finishes. Even now in Tour de Suisse, beating Wout van Aert, it's a sign of great things to come. He's, he's now beaten Wout van Aert here at a World Tour race. He's beaten Mathieu at a Grand Tour. It's a good sort of morale boost for himself. Even he beat Christophe Laporte last year came to Wavelham probably shows that he's now just building he's got that morale boost of being one of the guys that can beat them on his best day and with Wout's place and maybe Mathieu's place in the, in the Tour de France squads in terms of their own sort of position are they going for stages are they going for green are they doing this are they doing that they might be in yellow they might be defending Benjamin Grimaud doesn't have these responsibilities he could be sort of the wild card puncher in this year's Tour de France uh, but yeah, we'll see what happens with Benjamin Grimaud. But uh, uh, just to address, yeah, it's a bit of a weird background here. Uh, Patrick and you and all taking uh, the piss out of me uh, in the beginning. If you're listening and the podcast, I'm sitting in apparently the... What, what did you say, Ewan? I said that you currently look like you're in uh, the, the set of Game of Thrones. It's very sort of... Um, it's It's giving House of Tartarian. I don't know anything about that show, but it, I think that's a Game of Thrones word. Berate me in the comment section below. And I mean, I said that it looked like you're in the House of Lords because it's a green chair for people in the podcast. So I thought it seemed very apt. Oh, what? no, you've triggered you. In. Oh, here we oh, go. No. Is Mr. It a House I of have Commons? a politics degree is is going to use it now. Oh, I'm no. finally, finally using my political science degree. The House of Commons is the green one. I'm not I'm not one for politics. Listen, it's it's a green chair. People on the podcast. Scott looks like he's about to go, order, order, to everyone. Order, um, order. Yeah, that's what it looks like. But, I mean, um, yeah, sticking with the uh, Tour de Suisse, spoilers, Ma- Matthias Skelmos, so the Danish rider, he won the overall something. Jakob Fulsang never did, unfortunately, but, uh, yeah, the Dane taking it after the the time trial uh, stage, but... Well, I think we we could discuss about uh, Matthias uh, Skelmos as well. He's such an up-and-coming star, and hopefully we can get him on some kind of interview at some point. But for Trexic Fredo, big, 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 blah, blah, blah. Uh, but Juan Ayuso taking two stage wins. We've talked about him a lot. We haven't really talked about him here on the Echelon because he's not really been in any races because he was... Well, we talked about it at the Romandie, but uh, again, here, success in Switzerland. And um, how did you find the performance? And I mean, the question here is, uh, should he be going to the Tour de France since he's on such good form? The performance was really weird to me because he got dropped on stage four... I think I can't remember exactly, or it might have been stage three. I can't remember exactly, but he got dropped. But then the stage after, he it was it was unfortunately the uh, the Gino made a stage, unfortunately. But he then took time on that stage and celebrated by tapping the ankle, which has been giving him so much grief, which is quite cool. And then he smashed the TT. He beat Avonapol. He beat everyone in the TT. Like I know he's like he's a good time trialist. We've seen that, but. Beating Avonapol and Wout Van Aert and Bissiger and bang, 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 bang. Loads. Like, this was a really stark TT field, let's let's be honest. The fact that he did that is insane. Should he go to the tour? I don't know. I think that would just be too complicated with having Tade there as well, don't you think? Is that... I don't think I'm putting a user into a domestique role. He is... He's too good for that. I 100% agree. I think... The Tour de France squad is now sort of built around Pogacar. They've had this big plan. I know I often slate Jumbo for being too rigid, but I think they've got this plan. They've got a reliable leader who could do great things. Our user's time will come with the Buelta. And I feel without even to pull the Buelta, I have a feeling it could be Ayuzova at, at, at the Buelta Espana. But um, it's, uh, I mean, it was a strange performance how he was getting dropped and then he was there. But his win on on the, the stage down into La Punte was just incredible. Like, so emphatic and for a guy who's still 20 years of age it's it's just phenomenal my concern is the uae team has been built around pagacha around the tour right but there is coming a point now which uae are gonna have to face which is that a yuzo is getting very good and it will be criminal to not send him to the tour very like if not next year if not the year after so 
how are they going to manage Pagatcha and a Yuzo? Because surely a Yuzo would want sole leadership. So where does Pagatcha go? Does he f- off to another race? And also mm. Almeida. Don't forget Almeida as well. Um, yeah, exactly. I would like, say, I... Um, to be honest, I feel like Pogaccia is the kind of guy to go to to do a Giro Vuelta to get the boxes ticked and to have fun whilst I use the targets to Tour de France. It might be next year, it might be 2025. I think that's a real potential down the line. And I would rec- I would say Almeida would probably become the third leader at UAE by that point. Well, I'm not letting go of this burn. UAE team Emirates, the current team, Adam Yates, Mick Rubio, uh, Vega Stangalangin, Tarab Gacha, Mark Soler, uh, Rafa Maika, and Doma Nova currently. I mean, they've all got respective jobs. And I would say if I was going to try and squeeze a Yuzo in here, it's Mark Soler that I'm pushing out. I don't or, know. I'm getting Novak. 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 Yeah. Getting... Novak was nowhere in Tour of Slovenia. No, Mac. Anne was getting beaten by like Luca Mezgetch or Pill or something. Spoilers, spoilers. We're getting onto that. But I would say Vigor Stakelangen. Sorry, sorry to my boy. Yeah. But I would say him. But I also think Matteo Trentin should be in this squad. He looked brilliant at Dauphine. Yeah. And he's so experienced. Yeah. That is a good point. Why is Trentin not? That's almost more criminal. I think a Yuzo does in theory you could fit him in. God, would it be a bit of a hard one to manage? You're like a Yuzo, you need to pace Piaccia. It would just be it would be so UAE, wouldn't it? It, it would just be like, no, I am going for my own. It'd be like Movistar. It's not UAE, it's Movistar. It'd be like Movistar freaking Vuelta all over again. It would be such drama. Send a user to the tour, actually. Scrap what I said. We want to get the drama going. Hopefully Netflix are following UAE this year. I'm not sure if they are or not, but that would just be fantastic. Yuzo could, uh, could fit in there, yes. Will he go realistically? Probably not. A weird form of room Wiggins. Well, not really, because more Bernard Renault, Le Monde, I think. Cause it's because we don't know where Tad Rigaccio is, that unknown. We can see that Juan Ayuso is amazing. Well, we've been seeing him doing like sit-ups or whatever on social media. <laughs> But Pogacar is no, no longer riding with a wrist brace. Uh, pictures emerged this week, him riding without a wrist brace. I don't know if that was a one-off, but it showed good signs. W- w- he took it off purely for the Instagram picture. Wow, how fake. No, but um, also, I heard someone said, it might be Mikkel Biel, one of the writers said in training camp that Pogacar is flying. He's still, he's still riding to his top level at the moment, so... Oh, I think it was Bax, actually. It was a short Bax? Yeah, I think I saw the article. Well, short Bax is backing a Pogaccia there. So he's also rumored to be on the long list for UAE for the Tour de France. So who knows? Maybe he'll slide into the squad as well. Good climber. But is it not? Are we not seeing the Yumba thing if one of them crashes? Because, like, if Pogaccia crashes out, then they're riding for Adam Yates, I guess. They're running for Adam Yates, and they can hoover up stage wins. So you wouldn't take a Yuso. Ewan's not taking a Yuso. I want to take a Yuso. Patrick, do you want to take a Yuso or not? You're the team manager right now of UAT Memorant. God. Do you want the drama, or do you don't? Or do you just want the I'm, clear leader? I'm thinking, well, UAE have this whole plan where they want to be like the most dominant team, right? They've had a podium at Vigero. Realistically, they can get a podium, if not a win, at the Tour here. Do I trust Almeida to back up a podium position in the Vuelta, considering the fact that he perhaps got a little bit lucky with the COVID cases at the Giro? Probably not. I would probably favour sending a Yuzo to the Vuelta. To be fair, I just hate coming towards us. I I, I would. Only beat who's ahead of you. I'm just saying. I probably wouldn't take it because I would think it would be quite cool to have Almeida, Pagacha, a Yuzo on the podiums of the three Grand Tours. I think that would be something which UE would quite like. And it would be kind of a flex on like just everybody else. Yeah, I mean, all three of us don't really want to talk too much about the Tour de Suisse, but was, was there anything else? Remco's emotional victory as well. Dedication to Gino Matter was quite a fitting touch, I think. Mm-hmm. But yeah, was there any kind of else you... There was also... The man who, according to you and last week, is not doing anything at the tour or not finishing top ten of the tour, Felix Gal. Oh yeah, that what was a funny. Stage. <laughs> it was funny. Oh no. 
<laughs> that clip might not develop too well. But have you seen the updated GC standings from today? Yeah, he dropped like a stone. <laughs> yeah, he went down to eighth place in GC, so my bet's still still standing high. It, it, Felix Bell did look good there. He's been looking good on form, but he has he's good at one week long stage races and he's Zilt Chatter Grand Tour, so We'll wait and see. We'll wait and see. There were some other strong performances. Matias Skirmosa as well, with a, I mean, a, a win here. It's great for him. That fact that he could beat Avnipol and Ayuso. Skirmosa, super interesting character. There's a great profile piece on Rula where it, it tracks Skirmosa. He's from an interesting part of Copenhagen, I believe, Scott. And um, he served as a doping all ban. Of it, all of it's interesting. Come to Copenhagen. Copenhagen, I, I sponsor us. A, I believe he's from a pretty working class background in Copenhagen. Um, yeah, a working class in Denmark. <laughs> okay, we can't, we can't, we can't deny it too. Much. We can't push it down, squash it. But he served a brief suspension, uh, then ended up partying really hard during the, the suspension and got back into cycling in, in the end. And he, he says himself he had an ego problem when, when he was like a teenager beating everybody, and now he's just a, a, a great cyclist. And even with the difficult circumstances of this race, I think he handled himself very well, which is incredibly difficult given what happened. But uh, I mean, another rider that we've spoken about, Wout Van Aert, says he's not going for the green jersey, ends up winning the points classification here. But I mean, did I miss something? What happened with Primoz Roglic? Oh, he ended up not coming. He was in Novo Mesto oh, today at, at, at the Tour come. of Slovenia. Oh. Yeah, he was in the Tour of Slovenia, like bashing on barriers. Yeah, he, he's taking some time out. I, I feel like he he yeah the rumors the rumors did not come into fruition. But Roglic is uh, taking some time out in Slovenia, which is interesting because there is a certain time trial championships happening in less than one week's time on a mountainous time trial course in Slovenia, and there is a chance that Roglic might be there, as is Pogacar. So that would be very interesting indeed. Like 2020 all over again. Bum, bum, bum. I know Wabonart did win the points classification at the Never Tour de Suisse, but is it just me who thought that his performance was a little bit overwhelming? I was expecting Wout to win this week, and he didn't. I know that is a quite Wout Van Aert thing, is that he's just very consistent. He does well over lots of different terrain, and that is what he did. He did good in the TTs. He was up there in the breakaways, going up the mountains. He, on that stage, which Remco won, he finished second in the sprint, but there was something missing in my eyes. I don't know. I agree, but I will also say Tour de Suisse provides some very strange results sometimes, and maybe he'll he'll be back to full full pelt, but by the Tour de France. I'm basing this off of our 10 years, well, my, my 10 years of watching the sport intensely, that Tour de Suisse and Tour de Romandy in particular, can sometimes provide some of the, sort of the most bananas results and form sort of gauges possible. But I think for, for WoW, this is Wild Van Aert. He's right. He's racing for probably one of the most intelligent bike racing teams in the world right now. Laporte looks good, so why isn't WoW going to be good once we come back to France next month? Is there anything else we could say? In terms of the GC, we also had Kelderman. He was up there, even though yeah. he looked like he was a bit poor in the beginning, but finishing fourth, that was quite a good, good recovery. That's a good showing for being in the tall mountain train. Yeah, that's good. Outerbrooks was in the Outerbrook zone. Ah, good. Good news. But I mean, uh, we're going to shift our focus towards Tour of Slovenia. But first, we're going to introduce one of our new segments. We can't just have Rider of the Week because, uh, yeah, maybe you don't agree with that. Uh, sometimes our picks, but we are going to go for comment, well, comments of the week. And I mean, the first one that we've kind of talked about uh, together was a comment about the Netflix segment. We we well, obviously we went kind of in depth of what we thought. You and I hope you've seen the series now. But yeah, uh, I'll just read it out as well because it was quite interesting. Uh, they should have dove more into the data of these riders, what it makes, what it takes to make them so good compared to the average person. I'm sure they uh, could have dumbed it down to everyone to understand. They could have touched on the insane hours that they do, the body fat, uh, how much food they eat during the tour. My wife doesn't watch the sport, couldn't gain interest because I, it still seemed like guys are riding around in Lycra and it didn't get portrayed as crazy as as it actually was. I think that's quite interesting and uh, Netflix should take that on board. What did you guys think of that? It yeah. didn't demonstrate it at all. 
I I think that is true. I've seen some other things this week, especially from like well, I don't know. Is is it? I'm going to say another cycling podcast. I'm not sure if I'm going to get killed now, but like the new Francis Cade podcast, they were talking. <laughs> bah! Yeah. They were talking about how it was kind of, I don't know, from like a layperson, the whole yellow jersey, green jersey, yada yada yada, explaining just the very basic concepts of a tour wasn't perhaps done very well. But I don't know. There are lots of videos out there on the internet which can help explain that. I'm not sure if that's necessarily the role of the show to do that, but I think it would perhaps be good to see more behind the scenes. There was quite a lot of on bike kind of showing the racing, which is fair, but it would be cool to see the uh, the hardship of kind of the micromanaging of diets and being away from families and stuff like that, perhaps a bit more. Yeah. I still haven't seen it. I'm sorry. I just have not had the time. There's always one, isn't there? There is. I'm, I think it's too mainstream. I'm, I don't really want to engage in, in, in these, uh, in these activities, you know, you're just losing the edge and the substance, you know, I'll, I'll carry on watching LDM and us Pensado and raving about it. It's generally, I've just been very busy over the past week and, traveling a lot also netflix have really cracked down on their privacy and um security authentication which is making that one quite difficult uh but netflix, if you're watching please change your your, your company guidelines they're not watching <laughs> <laughs> but uh i mean patrick what was the one you wanted to flag up in terms of comments it's it's uh yeah Oh, my, mine was a funny one. I won't say my name, but for two, just it was on the episode. It was on the clip where we were talking about whether Pikachu will be okay, and like his specifically his wrist. And the dude just went, "Fellas, fellas, chill. He will be there with bells on." And it just cracked me up because I thought, "Is he going to run with a cowbell?" Because that, you know, he'll be alerted. Like Jonas will be alerted to whenever Pikachu is attacking if he's got bells on, because he's going to be like freaking jangling all over the place. You know, it's not a particularly stealthy move, but I just saw that and it made me laugh. To be honest with you, it was a, it was good because sometimes we, uh, I don't know, but there are mixed comments sometimes, and it's quite nice to see just the funny one. Yeah, I'm like watch the Roglic one. Watch that. Why Roglic will never win the Tour <laughs> de France? That is a cesspit of negativity. On the bells, it's like you know those bells you can get to put in like your your bag if someone's like trying to steal it. And it like yeah. rings so that you, you you know where it is, or like you have like bells on your like your wallet or your purse, so you know where it is in, in your handbag. It's like that, but like Pogacha would have that on his body, and Yumbo Visma tag it to him mid race, and he just got these bells so whenever he's trying to attack. Wilco Kelderman can like get to the front of the race and try to like chase yeah. him down or something. Would it be yeah. a Pogacha like face as the bell, a Pogacha shaped his bell, little, his little tufts at the top as yeah. well, yeah. I'm going to make that as merchandise and throw it out the tour caravan. Hell yeah. Jonas Wingo might be the defending champion, but I still think he's scared of Tadu Gacha in some respect after what happened at Paranese. But I mean, we'll see. Nevertheless, moving on to the tour of Slovenia and uh, hope you guys watched it. There was no Tadu Gacha. Quite an interesting race, a bit boring in the beginning. Dylan Hoenewegen dominating. And then we had, well, Jaco Jula just dominating the whole race almost from start to finish. And uh, yeah, Philippe Ozana taking a, his first kind, well, his biggest stage race, I would say. And there was a bit of competition as well from Matej Morohic winning the final stage, dedicating it to Gino Mera. But uh, yeah, what did you guys think of the Tour of Slovenia? And there is a question coming up at the end of your discussion. Oh, Christ. I'm scared now. I quite liked it. It was definitely complicated on GCN, kind of the GCN app. I was like, Slovenia, Belgium, Swiss, women's racing, downhill. I was, I was all over the place. But I did eventually, I did land on Slovenia uh, a few times. And yeah, I thought it was good. Yeah, I did actually forget. Jacob Lula did really dominate this race. Got Zana winning. He's had a really good season, hasn't he? He won a stage of the Giro. It's very easy to forget about, actually. And I think he's having an absolute stormer of a year. He seemed like quite a favourite to win in a way. I don't know. It seemed kind of logical that he was going to win. And because Mohoric is kind of like not the pure climber, so he's always going to struggle on that second to last stage. But then, like you say, he won on the final stage. That was really lovely to see his dedication to, to Gino. But like Jaco also won with some other guy who I can't remember his name of. Is it Pena or something? So... Jesus David Pena. He was stuck in like the little ring or something. 
going into the finale, it felt like there was a lot going on. I did enjoy the tour of Slovenia on the whole. I think you missed out the point as well. The reason why the Colombian did win was because Philippe Ozana took one of the most crazy crashes I've seen in a while. And of course, with what happened with Gino Mere, we were all kind of like, uh oh. Uh, but it was quite comical, to be honest, as Sana kind of crashed into this field with a poor horse as a spectator. And then you, next thing you know, you see him kind of doing a somersault or whatever. And then he's kind of running down the mountain, chasing his bike. I mean, still coming back, getting up and then finishing second on this stage, I think is quite impressive, to say the least. And uh, yeah, spoilers, I think he's probably going to be right out in right out of the week for that. Yeah, I mean, Pippo did, did great. I'm glad he's keeping up this momentum from the Giro, proving it's not just a one tour wonder. Also, you want to flag up someone in top 10, Paul Double or Dubal from the United Kingdom. He was brilliant last year at the Tour of Slovenia, caught eyes whilst he was riding for China Glory. Nobody knew who he was then. And then he moved over to not was, China Glory. Did you know about China Glory last year? Not China Glory. You're thinking of someone else. Jesus, sorry. Yeah, the Italian one. My bad. China Glory was Sean Quinn. Yeah, exactly. No, but I mean, was China Glory even there? I'm not I sure. Don't know they were there this Such year. a weird name. They weren't there <laughs> this year. Oh, okay. Time. No more glory. Yeah, it, it's great to see. Exactly. It's great to see Pippo Ganna keeping up this momentum from the Gidon and proving he's not just a one tour wonder. And also, Ghana? I just want to flag Pippo up. Pippo Ghana. <laughs> Third time lucky. Sorry, it's it's hot. <laughs> um, yeah. Exactly. It's great to see Pippo Zana perform super high. I got it right that time. You can't even. No, it's just funny. <laughs> it's great to see Pippo Zana perform um, highly here and keeping that momentum going from the Judah, proving he's not just a one tour wonder. Elsewhere in top 10, just want to point out Paul Double, Dubal from the, from the United Kingdom, uh, riding for Human Powered Health this year, rode another great tour of Slovenia inside top 10. Was He was up there on the Kolovrat stage, the mountain stage, won by Pena. And last year, he kind of caught eyes whilst he was riding for MJ Kvis, uh, riding inside top 10 at the tour of Slovenia on the ground. Nobody knew who he was in, in Slovenia, sort of turned heads there, moved on to Human Powered Health on the pro continental level. And got another good result here in Tour of Slovenia, proving that this seems to be his favorite race in the world. Two top 10s in GC at a pretty high level um, UCI race. It's great news for Paul Double. Hopefully he can uh, keep that momentum going in races outside of, of Slovenia in the years to come. But yeah, I mean, it, it, it was an interesting week of racing. It's such a beautiful country. It's always good to see uh, racing in that corner of the world. Absolutely stunning. Yeah, some really vicious climbs. But nevertheless, the question i saying... Obviously, Philippe Bozana took the victory, but can you name the two other Italian winners in recent... Well, the last two Italian winners of the race? Lissi. Well, I mean, yeah. Lissi and... must be one. And... Oh. Well, of course, pause the video if you're watching, and then you can try yeah. and answer in the comments, but... Who could it be? Oh, 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 oh. Oh, where's he going? He's got PCS in a book. <laughs> PCS coming out for the book version. I've got like the fact go out of date straight away. What could it be? Who could it be? I feel like this is cheating. Is it Scarponi? Oh my goodness, no, guys. Who is it? Vincenzo Nibali. Oh, oh crap. Uh, okay. Well, we all heard that, guys, so we'll just have to pretend that didn't happen. Uh, nevertheless. <laughs> We got wood right. <laughs> Nevertheless, the, well, we could, well, we'll probably, yeah, Belgian tour. I was about to go to the Giro under 23, but the Belgian tour, well, arguably the the home of cycling, the the promised land of cycling or whatever. And uh, yeah, what did you guys think of this race? It's the chaotic race with the golden kilometer. 
which is just like a defining feature, which I've actually I forgot about that at the beginning of this this like race. I was like, oh, it's just some sprint stages in a TT, but it was not just that. It was a Matthew van der Poel showcase, is what it was basically. It was really quite scary what he was just like sh- shredding the peloton apart. But it's also the race where, of course, when Cav in 2021, when he went to do so well in the tour, wasn't it the race that he went to prior to that, and he was like took a couple of stages, got a little bit of momentum going. The sprinters were largely dominated by Jakobsen and Philipson. Jakobsen took two, Philipson took one. And then, what was it, Son? Oh god, Scott's gonna glare at me. Sudden and Valenschold. Valenschold? How do we do, Scott? Yeah, I think pretty well, no? Yes! Sign me up to Norwegian residency. But he won the TT, and that was pretty cool. You know, under 23 TT champ last year. And so that was really cool, actually, to see him not just beating some nobodies either. You know, he was beating some serious names like Van der Poel and Lampart and Steimler and just other people who are just actually good at time trialing. So it was a very interesting week of racing, all in all. But um, it just makes me scared as to what Van der Poel's going to do with it all. Yeah, Vardenshot for me was a standout. Great TT and also staying up there in the GC was good. Also, Vatsek as well. This time, Matthias Vatsek, not his brother Karl. He rode a strong race for Czechs like Alfredo. Excited to see what he can bring for the rest of this year. But I mean, the Van der Poel Express in the, in the, in the lead outs, he was great for Jesper Philipsen. And then when he took that stage so dominantly, I think it just shows something here. Van der Poel is on excellent, excellent form. And um, I believe actually one of the Roadhofts, one of the managers of, of the team, actually said that he's pushing watts that they have never seen before. That's very intriguing for what's to come in only a couple of weeks' time in France. Of oh, what's to come. <laughs> oh, that was unintentional, but brilliant. But yeah, okay. Uh, we saw uh, Michael Van Poel ride the Giro and the Tour last year, and he was, well, quite rightly, quite fatigued after that. But yeah, what is a match of Andropol in 2023 going to do at the Tour de France? He's going to win stage one. That's what. That's exactly what he's going to do. We we all know. We can see it coming. It's it's an what uns- are the odds on that? Is it probably it's quite good you, or no? Probably like you're going to lose money, basically, because you, you're going to have to like the odds are so low. They've gone below one. It's, it's, it's a negative ratio at this point. That's how bad the odds will be. I think that it's an unstoppable train, this Van der Poel stage one victory. And nobody else may as well bother turning up to stage one, to be honest with you, at this rate. He, he is he is going to absolutely shred everyone. Unless that second to last climb is raced super aggressively by some climbers, like maybe quick step proper try and light it up for Alaphilippe, but their team isn't really designed for an Alaphilippe. It's quite designed towards a Philipson. He's only really got like Van Zeven and Bajoli really to set a hard pace on the climb. So like, is Pogaccio going to be keen enough to really want to shred it? Like, well, Ewan's nodding his head, so he probably will be. So if UE decide to really go for it, maybe Van der Poel gets a little bit of trouble, but good luck to everybody else on stage one because I think Van der Poel's winning it. What he'll do for the rest of the race, I don't really know. Lead out for Philipson, whether he'll just be quite content with stage one victory, does something else in some other intermediate stages, I don't really know. I agree. Van der Poel is a big race rider at a Grand Tour. It opens with a road stage. Winning this would be huge for him. He's done it at the Giron when he won at Visegrad. He did it at the Tour de France in 2021. He missed the mark on stage one, but redeemed himself on stage two. He's such a sort of big, sort of big race rider. All the monument performances he's had at the Ronde Sanremo this year at Roubaix. He's a guy you can rely on, and he's evidently on lightning hot form. The only people I see beating him on stage one are Jonas and, and Pogaccia, and that's if the finishing climb is harder than we think it is. Uh, it's a little kicker towards the end. Yes, we're getting close towards a sort of 10% point, but we've seen before that Matteo can hang on on those. If it were a sort of 5 6% climb, a little bit shallower than it is, I would say definitely Van der Poel could, could be right up there. But to be honest, I am also in, in, in accordance with you. I just think Van der Poel on a stage one with all that pressure, there's one man who can really rise to the occasion. And I think Pogaccio would be quite content in not winning. Stage one, I think he could. 
but for UAE, it's not number one priority. That could really change the whole dynamic of the race if he did. But I think Van der Poel probably wins the opening stage, could win stage two maybe if he wanted to, takes yellow until the stage into La Reims, I believe. Then I think the climbers or a breakaway will take the yellow jersey for a couple of days. Is it enough though? Like when you think about it, like what of an art green jersey well, winner taking stages here, there, and everywhere? Is this like fine for him in his career, just winning the opening stage, having the yellow jersey for a few days, and maybe taking a stage or two later on? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I think it is because you know what, winning like wearing yellow jersey for a couple of days and taking the stage, I would say that's quite a big, a, quite a big notable deal in terms of a career where. You know, you go into a Grand Tour and you're the first person to lead it for a couple of days. That's that's quite mon- monumental, you you would say. But for him elsewhere, maybe it's like the Giro in 2022, where he showed he was on great form, then went in the breakaways and some of these mountain stages and became more of a rogue rider. He also really wants to help y- Jasper Philips um, on his quest for stage wins in the green jersey. He's been a brilliant lead out man already this year for Jasper Philips. And if he wants to repay him for his, uh, for his dues from, from Paris-Roubaix, it could be a great sort of use to get him a couple to the front stages. I think they seem quite keen to put the the Jasper Disaster name that I didn't even know about. That was a thing in the Netflix thing, wasn't it? Jasper Disaster. I was like, that's a bit disrespectful, considering that Philipson actually is pretty world class. I think if they had the uh, 2020 vision and they could see in to this year that we're in right now, they'd be like, oh, actually, he's actually pretty good. I think you're right, though, Scott, in a way. It is sort of like, is he just going to be content with wins the opening stage, maybe wins one later on, but Alperson and Jumbo are teams of different objectives, I suppose. So, you know, Jumbo are very GC orientated with Wout on the side. I feel like Alperson don't have the the, the money to throw at a, a team like that. They have to almost be a bit more selective with what they're doing. And I think with what the, the riders which they have, I think they're getting like basically the most out of all of them. Um, they're definitely getting like their, their value for money out of every single domestique they have. And I think that, yeah, Van der Poel, you know, it's going to be hard because what else could he do? Go and fight for green with Philipson? <laughs> it's like, I don't know how that's going to work. There are a couple stages where you think maybe later on in the race they could sue Van der Poel if he's like up there in like a reduced group or whatever. But... For a rider type like Matthew van der Poel, he is so unique. He's such a, he, I think because he's that big time rider, I think he'd be content in going to a Grand Tour, have this big explosion on day one, take the jersey for a couple of days, absolutely fight for it, and then just sort of cruise home. You know, I think for him, the, 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 that would be quite quite nice and help all his teammates. He's not a sort of Wout Van Aert who sort of uses these Grand Tours as a canvas to paint his brilliance. And uh, these other sort of like serial stage winners like your Jasper Philips, like your sort of Mark Cavendishes of old, maybe of new, who sort of go there to win sort of four or five stages. And he's not going to be a Pogacar kind of type. I think he's there to sort of have these spectacular performances and have these sort of memorable acts like he did in the 2021 Tour de France, where he was a superstar in that for opening week. Even at, at the 2022 Giro, he he honoured that Malia Rosa valiantly until he gave it to uh, to Juanpe Lopez, if I recall. So I, I I think for Van der Poel that that would be how he acts in this race, and then sort of switches on to helping his teammates. There are plenty of people in Alperson who could take stages outside of Jasper Philips and Mathieu Van der Poel. They could probably be, dare I say, the most successful stage winning squad of this year's tour. Another thing is that it was a bit of a shame, of course, in the Netflix series that's just come out. Of course, Van der Poel wasn't in the greatest form at all last year, so we didn't get to see an awful lot of him and his spectacularness. Listenessness, whatever. <laughs> so, therefore, this year with a fully fledging Vanderpool, I can't wait to hopefully have the Netflix series come back and show the world as like, oh, look at this ach- absolute monster of a man who's just an absolute menace. And the can't pathos of, of Matthew Van der Poel yeah. is so powerful as well with the dynasty his history. With, with, with his father yeah. and his grandfather. But, anyways, I promised. More questions, and here we go. Belgian tour, we'll keep on that theme. Who was the last Dutch winner of the GC before Macho Van der Poel? Oh. Bonus point for a year as well. Lars Bo, 2011. Is that right? Correct rider. Can you name the correct year? Oh, it's not 2011. 2010. Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> I swear it's around that time. 
2014 before he won the Tour de France stage. 2009. But uh, anyway, oh. uh, we have a, a second question as well. Second question. Don't worry. Much of Paul takes the GC of the Belgian Tour. Hurrah, hurrah. Clap, clap, clap. But how many GC victories has he taken in his professional career? And we'll let you and go first because, uh, Patrick, you had too many guesses. This you're you're showing us up right now with this niche Belgian <laughs> tour knowledge. <laughs> Let's get back to no, no, okay. So, um, let me think. Let, let me dig deep into the memory vault. I thought Nibali was an easy one. Somehow not all I got of us a are Slovenia historians. Okay, um, he's not Slovenian. We didn't we didn't get we didn't think about that. <sighs> Found out a pool. You want. He's, he's, uh, I'm going to go on a whim here and say this is his first. No, nah, because he's, he's won the tour of Britain. Yes, he did in 2019. I forgot about that one. Has he won like an Aneco Bink Bank or something like that before? Yes, he won an Aneco in 2020, the COVID one. We say you, two, you already put your guess. You can't. I'm sorry. I didn't think hard enough. We're, we're, we're collaborating. This isn't going a friend. <laughs> oh, right. Sorry. Okay, I'll I'll just say three then. You would could have two, five, five. You and we're gonna need to do some revision. For, I'm gonna predict what we're gonna do be doing next week. Bing bang tour, Belgian tour, tour of Britain, and the Boucle de Mayenne twice. Oh. Boucle de Mayenne, oh, for... <laughs> Yeah, let us know down in the comments if you did better. Um, but nevertheless, moving on, I, we could go to the route Oxy 10, but I don't really care. Uh, Mike Woods won. That was impressive for Israel Premier Tech, them winning so, a stage race. Simon Carr won a stage. Oh, shoot. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Marlene Vandenberg won a stage. It was a bit EF for doing good. Yeah, this is also Simon Carr's quasi home race. So good yeah. to send you well here. Okay, so we did cover it, even though... There you go. It was the briefest roundup has ever been. <laughs> but the under-23 Giro, or the next generation Giro, and Patrick, you flagged this up in our chat, and uh, yeah, what what happened? One of the stages was going up the Stelvio, but yeah. it wasn't the wind that was the interesting part. I was just... I logged onto Twitter, as you do, in your cycling sphere that we're all probably in, if you're on Twitter. And I just see, like, a video of just... There's just riders who are holding on to motorbikes and team cars and stuff. And I think it was something like 24 people got disqualified from the race. The stage won by... Stouter Mitten? Yeah, yeah, it's somehow I don't remember that, but I don't know, we got some screenshots, we'll probably have them on screen or whatever, but yeah, it's just it was just ridiculous because there's been some disqualifications in the past, 2019 under 23 world champs for ACOF, for example, riders get disqualified for drafting behind cars too much, but it's been quite a long time since I've seen a blatant hanging onto a car, literally getting driven up a mountain disqualification, and it was quite comical. In a way. I was like, there's no way. It was also quite funny because in the video you can hear the person in the car scream at the riders to let go because they see the person filming. And uh, by, by, by that point, the, uh, the die was cast. It was too late and all 36 of them, rightly so, were disqualified. And uh, yeah, it was just a little funny moment uh, an interesting moment indeed i mean in terms of the uh the results that won those qualifications you know we had some had some interesting ones johanna stan stan Amitet winning we spoke about him the other week won our discussion about the children at yumbo visma uh also darren rafferty as well huggins berman action finishing in second place another sort of irish youngster coming through i also want to mention a swiss protege just 18 years of age of jan christen who writes for action hagen's berman's as well he took the seventh stage win at campilio dedicated that one to gina merda he is great sort of youngster coming through the ranks he's actually he used to write for the poggy team which is Tade pogaccia's youth squad that he funds over in slovenia uh, he's been sort of um, he's been his protege they're in good contact with each other they, they, they talk an awful lot uh, together and he's actually moving up to UAE next year to join Pogacar on the senior level he's just 18 years of age and then also Lucas Naroka for Trinity 
won a stage two. He was one of my first ride of the weeks. It was the week where it was the uh, Gran Camino, actually. The, uh, the race which follows a religious pilgrimage, if, if people didn't know. That, that is a fact which will stick with me forever now. And also Luke Lamperty, another rider for Trinity, got a, got a stage win. So the British racing scene is not entirely dead yet. Trinity is the last pillar. Um, so good to see them doing well as well. Just, just chat out. But we have got the Tour de France coming up soon in 2023. We've talked a bit yeah, about we... the squads. <laughs> We've talked a bit about whatever. But I mean, we might as well talk about who do you actually think is going to win the Tour de France? So we, well, we'll cast our, well, well, we'll put our predictions here and then we'll laugh about it in a month's time. Oh, well, more than a month's time. Five weeks time. And uh, I mean, I'm sure everyone in the comments will make fun of us before, after, whatever. But uh, yeah, how do you think the Tour de France is going to play out and who's going to win it? That's probably a good one. That's a tricky one. I haven't, haven't got my Tour de France head on yet. I've barely, uns- I barely unpacked my like Tour de France magazine and my wall chart and stuff. Who do I think? I think, who do I think is going to win? It's a tricky one. We're going to go with a slightly safer option. And I'm going to say that Jonas is going to win. Second and third, I'll go with Pogaccia and Hindley. But how That's... do you think it's going to play out? You need to think... give us the scenario. You need the... To... Oh, God, the scenario. Uh, I think that I, th- I some Palmy's being a bit pessimistic and thinking that this tour isn't going to be as exciting as last year. I don't think there's the stages quite set up, perhaps, for the stage 11 sort of craziness to be going on. You know, Roglic being there to be like the, the one two with Jonas, I think it's going to be more of a head on head fight. And I think that could be a little bit less interesting. So I think it's going to be largely fought out probably on like the Grand Colombier or something like that more than likely uh, that's going to be kind of the main one which I'm looking towards I know there's like the Tourmalay on stage 6 I think that stage will probably be a bit of a much of a muchness I think there's going to be a lot of hype but it might not live up to too much I think that Hindley I think he's just going to do it based upon pure legs rather than getting in breakaways and stuff like that I think he is just going to be the best of the rest but I think it will be pretty tight I think we're you know, the gap between Hindley and fourth and fifth will be like less than a minute, probably, be my estimates. But I don't know, Scott, I haven't got my crystal ball out yet. That's kind of as much as I can give you. I'll uh, I'll let you and come up with his theory now. I think Hogarth is going to win. I think it's going to flip. Wait, 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 of... wait. Whoa, whoa. Did we, did we all, did everyone get surprised by this? Ah, I think Hogarth is going to win. Honestly, I think the tide will completely shift in the final week of racing because Yumbo have been underwhelming in time trials recently. UAE have been really good. I think in that time trial that we have to Combleu, we're going to see Pogaccio really come into his own. And after that, the day after we have the, the Codalalo stage into think there, Pogaccio can gain a little bit more time back before he completely flips it in his favorite French mountain range the Vosges, and he comes back fighting on the Markstein and uh, takes the overall win of the Tour de France. I think UAE will really sort of come into their own in this race, and I think they'll be a really sort of exciting opposition to Jumbo Visma, who um, who might actually be, for once, outgunned by another general classification squad at the Tour de France. What do you guys think is going to happen on stage 20? It's like just very, do you reckon it's going to be fireworks, or do you reckon it's going to be a bit of a just breakaway victory, and it's not going to really do too much it depends where we are in, in, in the gc situation i feel like i mean where we were in the tour de france fam stage last year that ended here there were early gaps here that were sustained till the end women's racing and men's racing are very different but um i think it might be harder than we think the Vosges mountains have been quite difficult in the past look at the stages we've had at planche de belfi look at that the very the, the Vosges stage from the 2014 Tour de France where it was up and down, up and down, up and down. The one the Contador pulled out and it was absolute chaos the whole day. Nibli ended up winning. I think we're going to have some some really interesting racing through the Vosges. I'm excited. It could be cold. It could be rainy. It's time Let's for go. Pino. Pino is his region. Timo Pino wins stage 20 of the Tour. Stage 17 though, Col de la Loz. That is a grim climb. Oh, yeah, true. Oh, f- yeah, Miguel Angel Lopez winning last time. Roglic, 
cracking Tarbagacha as well. But I mean, that has a horrible profile and that could easily crack someone towards the end. But yeah, I think it's it is a shame that it seems like this these so clear front runners that we're not getting yeah if either of them underperform or whatever then suddenly it's a one-man show yeah we don't like, want another pass isn't there like we were kind of hoping that yeah. he could be we if... don't want a 2021 repeat of the gc but i'll do it if anybody's gonna be there i feel like it's gonna be hinley hinley's not a great one week long stage racer historically he's a great grand tour racer and i think that he's building up he's now won a grand tour and he knows he he knows how to measure it and maybe he comes into his own on, for instance, the Cordelalo stage, and he goes up in front of, and he's the only person able to follow the, these other two. I think maybe that can make for some quite interesting racing. He's historically in the two previous Grand Tours, he's podiumed. He's done really, really well in that final week. I'm, I'm really excited to see what Jai Hindley is going to bring here and what Bora can bring. I'm worried that they're wasting manpower with Sam Bennett, who I don't think is going to be right up there with a stage win. But for Jai... It could be it could be really exciting. Even maybe some of these other outsiders, maybe Ben O'Connor really rises to the occasion yeah. this year. He's been looking really good. It's a shame he just he wasn't great at last year's Twitter France and had to pull out, but maybe he can come into his own as well. I think I think the battle for third place is going to be super interesting, but I wouldn't be surprised if Hindley is closer to Pogacar and Vingo than we might maybe expect at this point. So many people. I mean, we've got Bardé, Hyman Yates, Adam Yates, Enrique Mass. Anyone from Ineos. Um, I was going to say Ineos after we do. slated in, them last in, week. But they're, they're just, listen, they're just, they're just not there, to be honest with you. They're just not. Like, pe- people can get angry in the comments all they want, but Ineos, they're not going to be as competitive as they have been in the past in this race because Garrett Thomas is is very consistent. You know, maybe he doesn't win, but he's consistent. And there's just question marks over pretty much every single. GC rider which they have I don't really classify Pitcock as a GC rider he was looking decent at the Tour de Suisse I think that he'll do a very Maverick-esque tour where he'll get in the break quite a bit I reckon that he could honestly just maybe goes for KOM I don't really know he was even saying in the Netflix thing that he was kind of getting bored basically of the way the tour was being ridden how he's just being a domestique so maybe Ineos without like a pure GC leader let him off the leash a little bit but I don't really expect much from GC from Ineos to be honest with you I'm doubling down on what I said last week. Yeah, I mean, we've spoken about Danny Martinez, Carlos Rodriguez, Egan Bernal. I mean, yeah. Oh. But, like, I mean, check out our clip on that because, uh, like you said, it, too, many, too much time has been spent on that. So are we not even entertaining La Dissimo? No. no. <laughs> Alexi Lotsenko? Oh, gosh. Don't bring up Lutsenko. Who's the who's the who's been the Lutsenko look for Lutsenko this week? Whole double is the Alexei Lutsenko of the race, <laughs> the Tour of Slovenia. If I was in the Bahrain camp and I had to put my eggs into one basket, I'm picking Bill Bow over Lander. Lander was underwhelming at the Dauphiné to a similar level that Godu was underwhelming at the Dauphiné. And I'm not trusting somebody who the last race which they did they were getting slapped about. To be honest with you, That's, unless you have some big master plan where he was never supposed to do well at the Dauphiné in the first place, in which case, fair play, you've got some pretty insane four vision there. But I don't, I'm not trusting Lander, which will really hurt the diehard fans, of which I know there are some. I mean, I would love to big up uh, Skelmoser to take something, a top ten or something, but. Uh, I mean, we've spoken about his performance at the Giro. It wasn't as hyped up as well it was hyped up him going there but he didn't live up to it so who knows what he's gonna do here and trek aren't really a gc team when you look at it on well do i stand corrected they are more the mass pillars and stoven show yeah. as well i guess i think skelmosa will be what aurelian palipentula was in the Giro. so that's exactly where i see skelmosa as a stage winner is is a realistic thing and then a top 15 in GC. That's where I see Skelmosa landing. Who do you think is going to be the best French rider? Or best contender that they have? Because we still, we are waiting, uh, well, since Bernardino again to uh, back in 1985 or whatever, to uh, that another year is added on to that drought. I think that drought will last another summer. It will be prolonged. And almost, it's it's like you're in the middle of the desert. 
and you can see the like mirage the, the sort of like wavy lines in the distance i forgot what the word is and like you keep walking towards it and you think i'm gonna find water eventually i'm gonna find water eventually i'm gonna find it i'm gonna find it but you just never find it and you end up and then you end up dying of dehydration you know i'm not seeing a pathway here where france are going to win a tour de france in the next 10 years i'm afraid maybe from lenny martinez haven't spoken about him um, due to time constraints we can't talk about him but yeah i mean i i don't think we're going to see a, a sort of s- great french spectacle this year's tour de france actually to be honest if we're going to get a french stage win it's going to be from laporte i would probably say barde i'd favor barde over go do the gc right now yeah how a few That's months funny. has changed everything unfortunately i know but nevertheless, coming to our final part of the show, everyone's favorite rider of the week. And I mean, yeah, I mean, we had Patrick go first last time, I think. So Ewan, who's your rider of the week this week? Blank says, says that you, you don't know. Blink twice if you're in trouble. Um, I'm going to go for Juan Ayuso because I think that performance he gave on the mountain stage to La Punt was was fabulous and the fact that he won a time trial without uh, beating the likes of Bissiger and even the Paul and uh Wild Fun Arts was particularly impressive I think he's the person who's impressed me the most over the past week I'm kind of wondering who to pick because I kind of feel like I know who Scott's going to pick I mean I have two so whichever you pick I'll pick the other one because you were saying about Philippe Hazana that's a very good one but I kind of want to go with um Son Van Skold for his TT victory at the Powers Belgium tour. I think, like I said earlier, it wasn't just a nobody TT. There were some big names in there. And I think that it's good to see that sometimes we do see under 23 world champs in the individual time trial, like a Bjerg or a Johan Price Peterson or whatever. You know, perhaps they don't hit the mark just like immediately. It takes them a couple of years to get into it. So I think it's good to see that Van Scord has just smacked into it. Hopefully, he gets selected for the tour. I think that was just a a, a performance punching above his weight. Yeah, he's probably going to be on the tour. He is Norwegian, so yeah, I think he might be sacrificed. Uh, Danish rider might be sacrificed for him, probably. But uh, I, I mean, now you left me conflicted because I was hoping you were going to go for Sana, and then I didn't. I could pick uh, Skilmose, so. Uh, oh, I just think what well, Sana crashing and then still finishing second was so impressive. But I I can't go against the Danish thing. Okay, I'm going to have to pick Skilmose because I can't remember the last time we had a Danish winner of the Tour de Swiss. I'll tell you, actually. Ooh. It was never. Really? He is the, he is the first Danish winner of the okay, Tour de Swiss. Then I have to pick him. Sorry, Zana. Because Zana, I'll have you know, actually, uh, v- v- Vincenzo Nibali and Diego Lissi are both Italian winners. Of a tour of Slovenia, that is uh, something which I definitely have known for a long time. But anyways, that's it for our episode 21. And of course, we're available on all the different podcast platforms. So if you'd rather listen to us there. And yeah, that is basically it. And all the social media stuff is down below because I can't be bothered to read it out. And uh, yeah, make sure to follow everyone on Twitter or whatever if you want a bit more content. But uh, yeah, well, as always... Subscribe to the channel as I think we're past a thousand, hopefully, when this comes out. But if not, please help us nudge it over the line and comment down below. And you could be potentially in our comments of the week section. So uh, with that, thank you very much for watching and we will see you around.